Hey, how's it going guys? Captain Cubic here and welcome to another God of War video. If you look at my last video, you might have noticed that I took a bit of a hiatus from YouTube and Twitter altogether. I feel much better, I feel refreshed, ready to come back to make some content. And I thought I would tackle something that you guys have been asking me to do for <laughs> quite some time now since God of War Ragnarok released. And uh, that is the new boss ranking. Yep, I made one of these videos, I want to say like a couple of years ago, and I haven't made one since God of War Ragnarok came out. And that feels almost wrong because there's so many good boss battles in Ragnarok that I feel like I need to talk about them. And because I didn't do a unique ranking to that game, I thought I would just do like a full series ranking again. However, this time around I do come with some rules as to which bosses I will not be including in this list. I know that was a big complaint you guys had from my last video. Th this time around I will not be including what you guys called non-bosses bosses. By this I mean highly scripted moments like the second encounter with Baldur or the quick time events with Helios or Icarus. Th those are not really boss fights and I think we can all agree on that. I will also not be counting quote unquote bosses that are just enemy reskins. I think we can all agree that bosses like the Mole Cerberus or Gulvik are just identical to regular enemies. They ain't fooling anyone. In this category, I will also include trolls. I know most of them are just big enemies like the Cyclops from the Greek games, but I also feel like some of them were used in the place of what should have been unique bosses, but because they're almost identical to regular trolls, I feel better just leaving them out completely. I don't think any of you guys will complain about that. Now, I know this one will hurt some of you, but I will also not be ranking every single Valkyrie and every single Berserker. There's just too many of them that are very similar. However, I will be ranking each of their leaders like Sigrum, Gana, and King Rodolfo. And lastly, and most painful for me, are the dragon side bosses of God of War Ragnarok. Look, these are probably my favorite dragon boss fights in any game. Just when you get that spear and they're flying up there and you just hunt them down like a whale and you, you shoot it and then they fall down like a meteor, like that's amazing, okay? It's a really good boss fight when they pick you up and they take you up in the sky. Like for a side boss fight, it has a lot of, you know, spectacle and it's just the, the mechanics, the fight itself, they feel very good. But again, like there's a couple of them and they're all, they're all identical to each other. So uh, I guess they're getting a little bit of a little, you know, nice try metal, you know, if, if you were just a unique boss, you would definitely be included in here, but as it is right now, why am I rambling? So now you're probably asking yourself, with on what criteria are you going to be judging this, these bosses? Is it going to be spectacle? Is it going to be uh, the mechanics, you know, how well the, they feel? I, I don't really have <laughs> a, a specific criteria. I'm mostly going by just how memorable each boss was. I'm looking for uniqueness, I guess. While still being good, I hope that will be more clear as I go, you know, on in the video. But I think I think it's time we start. And we gotta start somewhere. We gotta put how they say the stake in the ground and start with the absolute worst boss fight of the God of War series. And I think that one goes to the Dark Rider of God of War 2. This boss a couple of years back, I would have said I kinda liked it because, like I said at the beginning in the intro, I said it was unique. You know, you're flying on your Pegasus, you're fighting this enemy. But recently when I played this game on Titan, someone in the chat made me realize that you didn't really have to fight this guy. You could just charge forward and just avoid the boss fight entirely. You did have to do the quick time event, but that one's pretty easy. By the way, the quick time event is really cool, but again, it's just a quick time event. The boss fight itself, because you can skip, but I think we can say it's the worst boss fight in the series. Following that, it's not one that's very far behind it, that's Demos. He has a couple of unique moves, but the fact that you know you're not going to kill him already takes away that intensity that a boss fight needs. Also, a chimp could defeat him, like this is just way too easy. Next is Scylla, the most of the disappointing intro boss fights. It's really sad for me to say this because God of War has always been known for their intro boss fights, but uh, Scylla? Scylla wasn't it, man. First of all, all you have to do is hit one of her tentacles, then you kill her crab minions, and sometimes you hit her face. She does have another attack where she tries to kill you with all of her tentacles, but you can literally just block these attacks. I understand it was a tutorial boss fight, but god damn it, it was just too easy. You know what? Screw you, Scylla! I'm <laughs> Next is Callisto. She is technically a boss fight, given that she has a unique set of attacks, and by that I mean an arm slam and a charge. 
It can be pretty fun dodging her charge attack and seeing her slam her face on the wall, but in reality Callisto is just a very slow moving target whose only advantage is when she enters a blind spot in the camera. You would really have to be brain dead to die to this boss fight. Next is the Pyreus Lion from Ghost of Sparta, who's only slightly better than Callisto because he moves around a lot more, but in reality he's just a really big Cerberus. He, he almost went in that category with the Mole Cerberus, just barely escaped it. Moving up on the list is the Persian King from Chains of Olympus, who feels more like a boss fight, but is still too easy to defeat. He's also not that unique from regular enemies. He's just a big guy with a big sword whose attack patterns can be learned in less than 20 seconds. The sad thing about this fight is that originally it was going to be a lot more unique, as you would have to fight him while he was riding a Persian war elephant. But as it stands right now, it's just a big guy with a big sword that occasionally brings out the Ifrit. Next is Hermes, and look, I wish I could put this fight higher in the list because it's somewhat unique. The first stage of this fight is pretty much a chase through all of Olympus, it's just a cool action, high octane action moment, but if you really think about it, it's really scripted, and it's only exciting the first time you do it, after that it just gets repetitive. Other scripted games have done like chase sequences much better, like the Uncharted 4 and the, the Madagascar chase, like even though that one was scripted, it felt like you could, like you had more freedom, like you could have more room to make mistakes. I know that sounds bad, you feel more like you earned it, right? But the next stage is the actual boss fight, which is, look, it's it's pretty easy, like it's, it's it might even be easier than the previous one I've been talking about. I appreciate that they kept Hermes attributes in the fight instead of finding an excuse to make him a more traditional boss fight, but him running around and slapping you just doesn't translate well to a boss fight. All you have to do is spam R1 and square until he gets tired. It's unique in the sense that you don't really have to think much about your attacks, you just, you just do whatever and hope you hit him. Next is Vartal Joffer, or the biggest disappointment a father could have like I can't tell you how disappointed this fight was man I don't even want to spend two minutes talking about how forgettable this fight is the character design is very similar to other dark elves the environment is bland as hell and worst of all his moves are identical or almost identical to that of regular dark elves the only thing making this a boss fight is his lengthy health bar, which admittedly can offer some fun when you're playing on harder difficulties, as one move can send Kratos to an early grave. But other than that, this fight was beyond forgettable. Next is Gryla. Oh boy. Do you guys remember when I said this prior to the release of God of War Ragnarok? I think Santa Monica needs to let us fight at least one giant. And I'm talking about a real giant. The size of Thamur if you want an example. I'm glad my prediction came true and we did fight a giant, but damn, Gryla was just not what I was expecting. I do love the scale of the fight, but pretty much all you have to do is shoot her magic pot until she gets tired. Sometimes she makes you change which part of the ground you stand on, which can be somewhat fun, but really all you do is shoot her pot? It's really sad because we never had a boss fight in the God of War series with this perspective. Sure, you fight giant creatures, but it's always done in a more scripted manner. With Gryla, you can walk right under her whenever you want, but there's no reward for doing so. It doesn't feel like you're fighting a giant. I would expect when she went for a stump that you could shoot an arrow up her foot or something. Like, like a much more dynamic boss fight is what I was expecting, but, you know, it's just, it's okay. It gets the job done, but I don't know. I was expecting more from a God of War game. Next is Theseus, or should I say a bunch of minotaurs, as Theseus cowardly goes up on an unreachable place as she shoots snowballs at you. Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of bosses that make you fight minions instead of themselves. There are some good moments when he's on the ground, but it's nothing that will leave you wanting more. Overall, he's kind of a tedious boss fight, which I'm guessing it's why it feels so satisfying when you make him eat the door he's guarding. Next is the Basilisk from Chains of Olympus, and look, I feel bad judging anything from the PSP games due to how many limitations developers had to work with. And when you take that into account, the Basilisk as a boss fight is pretty impressive, but it just can't compete with other big bosses in the series. For starters, the first encounter with him was good, but very similar to the first encounter with the Hydra. The second time you fight him is a little bit better with his fire attacks. The most fun one in my opinion was the section where you have to avoid his fireballs as you run towards him. Overall, it's a pretty decent boss fight for the PSP, but nothing to write home about. Next is Hecatonkeries, or should I say Magira's BBs. By BBs, I mean boob bugs. Not gonna lie, I was a little disappointed when this crazy looking mythology monster was teased as a boss fight, and then all you had to do was fight his arms that were infected with bugs. But you know what? They aren't that bad. I used to hate him a lot more, now I can see that they're not so bad. 
The first one takes the Titan technology that Santa Monica developed in God of War 3 to make some pretty impressive looking moments. The second stage is also pretty good. I also like how natural his split hand looks like an actual creature. However, the biggest issue I have with this fight comes in the third stage, where you have to hit his infected teeth as you're fighting his minions, while also the camera zooms out a mile away. Yeah, I don't know whose idea that was. Like, this stage almost makes me want to put it below the Basilisk from Chains of Olympus. It's like the Basilisk is just decent, and this one has a couple of good moments, but man, that last stage is so bad. And I also found it kinda silly. I know that God of War has always been over the top, but I just didn't buy into the whole thing of Kratos like riding his bug arm and then hitting the main bug face as the Titan like wouldn't you just pull away your head? like it doesn't make sense it just looks hey wouldn't we just put him like wouldn't we just make him do what he does to the cyclop but on a much bigger like it doesn't translate well I don't know it's just it was it was an okay intro fight but that's it next is Scorpius from God of War 3 and I feel really bad about this one because I really like the concept, but when it came to execution, it just didn't work very well. The custom we're talking about is having to use the Nemean Cestus to break his legs in order to weaken him. Again, it sounds like a fun concept, but it just ended up feeling a little bit clunky. There were also times where he would just disappear, leaving you to fight his babies. The most fun part, in my opinion, of this boss fight was when you had to fly towards him and also dodge his icicles. Like, that one, it's like, it, it's got spectacle, it's got a little bit of action, I, I like it. It, it, it's nice. There is some fun to be had with this boss, I just wish the execution was a little bit better. Next is Persephone, and again, it truly hurts me to place a final fight this high up on the list. But Persephone just isn't very interesting. It's a good, it's a decent boss fight, but I feel like I should have had more moving parts given that it was the final fight. The first stage is pretty good, but quite short. And the second one, she stands on pillars and just shoots projectiles at you, which can be easily deflected. I know the fight is more challenging on a harder difficulty, but overall it's just a very bland final boss fight. Another disappointing final fight has to be Electo and Tisiphone from Ascension. This fight isn't necessarily bad as much as it feels out of place. I have no problem with big boss fights, in fact, I quite love them. But I just feel like the final fight of any game should feel more personal. In Ascension, all you do is fight yet another Kraken creature, which by this point you already fought two of them in the series. And the sad thing is that this wasn't even the best Kraken boss fight, but more on that later. The Symphony also plays a role, but it's very minimal, like you're fighting on ships and she puts like illusions and you have to break them with the Eyes of Truth. Like it's it's, it's a very disconnected boss fight, like that would be like the, the verb I would use, right? It just, it was okay, but eh. Next is Perseus, who has to be one of the most unique boss fights in the entire series. Like I said with Hermes, I really appreciate that Santa Monica found the way to implement Perseus' personality of being a cunning warrior into the fight itself. The first stage is my absolute favorite, because Perseus goes invisible, fuck. The first stage is my absolute favorite, because Perseus goes invincible, invisible you moron, invincible is when you're impossible. If you don't know what I'm talking about, like what's cool about this fight is that you have to look at the ground and see where he's stepping, like that way you can determine where he is and attack and like you're, you're fighting blind but it's such a, it's such a fun concept. This adds a nice layer of thinking that's not always the case in boss fights. This however is only the case in the first stage of the fight. After that the fight becomes somewhat forgettable. He attacks you with a sword and shield and when you're done with those he brings out a slingshot. I mean, a slingshot to kill the guy who killed the God of War. Come on, Perseus, and I know you could have tried a little bit better. It's like the fight is backwards. The most fun aspect was used in the beginning, and then it became more generic. It was almost a great boss fight. I, I wish I could do I could do better by you, Perseus, but this is all I can do, man. I'll go 12. That's the best I can do. Okay. I'll go 12. Next is Pollux and Castor, and right off the bat I have to say that the chase sequence at the beginning was more fun than Hermes, although it was a lot shorter. <laughs> the fight itself is decent, some camera issues and breaking the pillars can be tedious, but it's a decent enough boss fight, the first stage feels a lot more up close and personal, and in the second stage you have to be more aware of Pollux's magic attacks. Again, it's a decent boss fight, but not something that's gonna turn your opinion on God of War Ascension. Next is Bjorn, who in my opinion is a much better tutorial boss than 2018 Stroll. Mostly because this guy has a pretty extensive set of attacks that you really need to master before you can continue in the game. 
I also love the fact that it comes with a plot twist that it was Atreus all along. And that moment when Kratos gets all mad, it's like, he like, yells at the bear back. Like, it's such an animalistic moment, like, so such raw power between uh, Kratos and the bear. Like, it's just, it's a cool fight. It feels, it feels unique, right? The, the only reason why this boss fight finds itself so high up in the list is because it's it's just a bear. Like it's, it's got good mechanics, but uh, it, it's just a big bear. Like uh, I add a bit of a sprinkle of mythology in there, and I, I think it might have been better. Next is the dragon Ras... <laughs> Ras... <laughs> I hate Norse names, man. <laughs> the dragon from 2018. I think in my first ranking video, I placed him a lot higher. That has obviously changed after I experienced Ragnarok's stake on giant bosses. But the dragon in 2018 is still a pretty good boss fight in my opinion. I know Mayo makes fun of him because you just attack his toes, which I guess is a valid point. But I don't know, I kind of like when you have to run around searching for explosive tree sap to weaken him. Like, sometimes you fail and like it just, and that adds more to the intensity of fighting a giant dragon. I will say though, I want to give a shout out like I did in the intro to the side dragons of Ragnarok. I, and uh, honestly, I think I had more fun with those bosses because it feels like you're more in control. But you know what? The 2018 dragon boss fight was a good, good start for big bosses in the Norse era of games, if I say. Next is one of the most underappreciated fights in the series. Erinus, the daughter of Thanatos, the god of death. Pain given form, evil given life. I'm sorry, you've caught me monologuing again. What can I say? I love it when a boss is depicted as a despicable badass. I think it adds a layer of urgency that some bosses don't have. Like, did you really think you were going to kill Angrobota's grandma? No, that sort of lowers, you know, the intensity of fight requires. Eren is on the other hand is a despicable character that you can't wait to fight. Her humanoid form isn't that unique, but she's a fast fighter who constantly summons birds to help her. It's a fight that will truly test your parrying skills. You have to juggle these things until you rip both of her wings. Then she brings out her monster form that tests your ability to get a button right. Like, it's the only thing. It's not very difficult, but you gotta get that circle button right. I know it was easy, but it was more of an excuse to have the next section where you have to chase her in the air while also dodging wind patterns that push you further back. Very similar to that Scorpius section I mentioned before, but a lot more intense if you ask me. Is it an easy fight? Yeah, kinda. But I don't know, I just like the pacing. Ready at Dawn knew not to overdo it with her. Instead, they made her more of an appetizer for the much better fight with Thanos. Sorry, Thanatos. I always get those two mixed up. Next is Scaron, my favorite boss fight in Chains of Olympus. This fight is probably my favorite because it's aware of the PSP's limitations and steers clear of them. And the result is a very dynamic boss fight. He will attack you with his scythe, shoot projectiles that require parrying, he will teleport all over the place, he will even self-heal if you're not fast enough. It's a boss fight that keeps moving and I couldn't have asked more from a PSP game. Okay, so now we're entering the good category. And what better one to kick off this part than Magira and Tisiphone from Ascension? The first of a few dual boss fights in the series. Right off the bat, I have to compliment the first stage of the fight, which essentially takes place inside Kratos' mind. And as you guys know, I'm not a big fan of bosses that make you fight their minions. But it was kind of cool seeing Kratos fight against his Spartan brothers. They aren't even reskins of other soldier enemies. They have their own attack patterns and even move like a real Spartan team. Next, you have to fight Magira and Tisiphone at the same time, which they turn out to be a pretty effective team. Magira is the muscle and Tisiphone is the range. This makes for some pretty fun moments when you have to outthink their tactics team moves. It's a pretty good boss fight to kick off the good category, but obviously there's a lot more ahead of this one. Now, for a couple of entries I've mentioned how sad I am to place some bosses so high up in the list, because in concept they are great boss fights, but in execution not so much. Well, forget about all of those bosses, because the one that makes it the most sad in that sense is the Heimdall boss fight. I should remind you that Heimdall still finds himself in the good part of the list. The first stage while he's riding Ghoul Raptor is pretty fun, and the third stage where he's constantly charging at you with his Bifrost arm is one of the most intense boss fights moments in the entire series. Absolutely great. So great, that if they had nailed the second stage, I could see myself placing Heimdall in the top 5 in the ranking. Not even lying. Okay, so what's my issue with the second stage? If you don't remember, before fighting Heimdall, you needed to get the drop near spear in order to overpopulate his senses. When I heard that, I started to salivate, because I thought the game was going to give me a lot of freedoms in the ways that I could overpopulate his senses. I was already imagining putting spears near Kratos and waiting for him to get close only to explode him, or throw a spear at a wall and they throw Heimdall towards it. 
And technically you can still do these things and they still feel pretty good. But the issue is that you don't have to do it because the boss fight doesn't trust you enough to be clever. Sometimes Heindel will deflect the spear and very conveniently land right in front of him, which gives you enough time to explode it in front of him. Or sometimes he will grab it and look at it like a monkey who has never seen fire before, once again giving you enough time to overpopulate his senses. <laughs> I just wish I was the one doing the outthinking. You, again, you can still do it, but it's kind of sucky that the game doesn't give you enough freedom to do it, like the game doesn't trust you enough. Still, the fight is very good, I want to reiterate that, but it could have been so much more than what we got. I guess that's always been Ragnarok's slogan, am I right? Next, I decided to go with Clotho, the most beautiful of the fates. She is so beautiful that I have to blur the entire footage I'm showing right now. All jokes aside, Clotho is a very unique encounter. I say encounter because the first stage is more of a puzzle. As a kid, I must have spent hours trying to figure out how to trap each of her hands in the most gruesome ways possible. It's difficult, but it's very rewarding just getting to figure out that whole like stage. After this, you get a more traditional boss fight, but it still contains that puzzle element that older God of War bosses were known for. You have to put her arms to sleep and you can either do this by being really good or using the time abilities that are in the environment. After this you have to pull on the lever and bring out the the, 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 the blade she uses to cut the threads of time and then you have to... It's, it's a really rewarding boss fight because it truly is all about skill. If you don't know what you're doing you might be in this boss fight for like 20 minutes just trying to get the arms to fall asleep at the same time. But if you're someone like me who's played this game multiple times, you can do this boss fight in like a minute max. It's just, it's that easy because it's if you know the steps, you know how to do it. Again, it's more of a puzzle boss fight, but I think that's what sets it apart from all the other ones. I just really like it. Following the tradition of puzzle boss fights is the Minotaur from God of War 1. I'm not going to talk too much about this because it's a simple concept, it's just very effective. You weaken him with your blades and then when he gets a little bit dizzy, you go to the back of the room and turn on the ballista and shoot a log to his chest until all of the armor he has breaks down. It still has that puzzle element that Clotho has, it's just that the puzzle here is much more easy to understand. Once you figure out, you know what to do throughout the fight. The only thing that changes is the intensity, like the Minotaur just gets angrier and angrier, and that, that just makes for a better boss fight. The in-between quicktime events feel a little bit clunky, but man, it's just, it feels so rewarding getting to shoot one last ballista through his chest and nail him to the door. Like, it's just, it's just an iconic God of War boss fight. I can't, I can't explain it any other way. Next, we have Zeus from God of War 2, and oh boy, I can already hear the heretic comments. <laughs> Look, I know this boss fight's great, okay? My main issue with this fight is the first stage when he gets old. He, he turns into a giant and you have to kill the sirens and like, kind of knock him down. Like, that part is a little bit, eh? You know, it's not bad necessarily, but it's just kind of weird seeing Zeus being a giant creature. <laughs> like, it's, it's that whole thing with final boss fights feeling more personal. And the good thing is that's what you get on the second stage when he comes down to your size and uh, you're changing the Blade of Olympus for the Plates of Chaos. Like, it's a very dynamic fight and I really like it, but obviously there is another Zeus boss fight that's uh, 20 times better. But more on that later. Next, we have the Barbarian King. And look, I really don't have much to say about the Barbarian King. It's just a good boss fight. It's not something that... It's amazing, right? But it's just a really good boss fight. The first stage you have to fight him while he's on the horse, and that one is a little bit annoying, but it's all about skill. You really have to learn how to find shorter pathways to get to the horse fast before he shoots an arrow to you. It gets even better when he, uh, once again, comes to your size. It's a boss fight that's really going to teach you how to dodge at the right time. At least that's what I learned in, when I was playing the, the game on the Titan difficulty more recently. It's just a, a really good boss fight. I guess the only thing I would complain about this boss fight is its lack of importance in the story. I know he's not like one of the top villains Kratos has fought against, but you know, if you look at the prequel comics, the Barbarian King is a really important character back then. He was fighting against Kratos to heal his father. They, they have history, right? And in God of War 2, you just kind of bump into him and kill him. Like, it feels kind of underwhelming like that. But the boss fight itself, like mechanics-wise, it's really cool. And hey, you get to see the boat captain again, and that's that's always good in my book. Next we have Thanatos, the god of death. <laughs> I think this fight stands out because it was the first fight in the series where you have a companion to help you in the fight. And that usually leads to some pretty cool tag team moments between Kratos and Demos. 
Thanatos is also a very well-versed boss. He has a humanoid form that has fast attack moves, but he can also turn into a giant monster that does some serious damage if you're not careful. But do you remember what I said at the beginning of this video? The closest thing to a criteria in this video will be how memorable the fights are. And when it comes to this fight, it doesn't get more memorable than Kratos going Super Saiyan. After I was done recording the script for this video, the news regarding the passing of the Dragon Ball Z creator broke out. I have never watched the Dragon Ball Z series, but the amount of love I've seen towards this creator has been nothing short of wholesome. And despite not having watched the show myself, even I know what going Super Saiyan means. That's how influential this person was. Perhaps one day I'll get around to watching the show and feel what you guys and gals are feeling right now. But until then, all I have to say is, rest in peace, King. Overall, this was a fight that was able to merge a personal aspect that goes with every final boss fight and a little bit of God of War spectacle with it. Next, I have two boss fights that I'll talk about at the same time because they are somewhat similar. Of course, I'm referring to King Rodolfo and Gana. And look, don't think that I won't go too much into detail about these fights because I don't like them. They are one of the best things the Norse games have added to the series. But with that said, after the first of these types of like super difficult bosses, they start to lose that special feeling you got while fighting Sigram, the first one. What I'm saying is, I really like these fights. I spent hours leveling up and learning their attack patterns. But at the same time, they just can't compete with the original because that novelty is no longer there. What I'm saying is, just wait until I talk about Sigrum, it's pretty much the same fight, but um, Sigrum is special, I think we can all agree with that. Next we have Magni and Modi, the sons of Thor. First of all, I think it was a great decision for Santa Monica to add such minor Norse mythology characters into the game. They, in my opinion, have become one of the most intriguing characters in the series. Modi is the trash talker, while Magni is the qualified badass. Surrender! The old father demands it. I just like saying that quote. The fight itself is a solid dual fight with two powerful brothers. Magni is the muscle and Modi is the range attacker. And the thing that sets this fight apart from the fight with Magira and Tisiphone is that this time around you also have a companion. Meaning that you can approach the fight in two different ways, which adds a little bit of replayability. Okay, while well, listening to this while I was editing, I noticed that I said as instead of ads. I'm not gonna change it, I think that's a very funny speech typo and I'm gonna keep it in. In one fight you can choose to tackle Magni, while in another you can choose to tackle Modi. And depending on which one you choose, you'll have to adapt in different ways. The only silly thing in this fight is the old uh, Frokle blinder thing where you just kind of have to like move the joystick and wait for them to come and then just, it, it, it's kind of silly, but uh, I don't know, it's a good fight because like after every single stage the brothers just get more and more powerful and you have to adapt to their new moves. And again, that it, it goes really well with the companion mechanics of God of War 2018, but it, it's this high in the list because in my opinion there's another better dual boss fight in the Norse saga and I'm sure you know which one I'm talking about but uh, as I've been saying in this video more on that later next is Poseidon and oh boy I can already see the hate comments I know I'm gonna get some hate comments for placing Poseidon this high up in the list but uh, if I'm being completely honest the fight is really good it's has a lot of scale but you don't really fight Poseidon that much the first few fights with this uh, horse water thingies, the Hippocamp, I forgot the name for a second, it's pretty good. Like, they used the tight mechanic really good to get some really cool perspectives, and the fight, the fights can be somewhat demanding. And even the fight with Poseidon himself can be really good when he gets up close with the giant water form he has. But again, like, there's times where you're just hitting the crab legs and you're not really doing much. It's a really easy fight, and I get it, it was an intro fight and usually those are easier, but uh... Again, <laughs> there's a much better one down the line. <laughs> the next fight is the Kraken from God of War 2. This is also one of those fights that in my opinion is heavily underrated. It's another one of these fights that has a puzzle element where you have to use the dead body of the last Spartan to put him on the pressure plate and release steam that you can use to fly up and hit him in his giant ass pimple. <laughs> The fight itself has a little bit of platform mechanics, not just with the steam, but you also have to climb on his legs and just cut him like one by one. If I'm being completely honest, the fight is good, don't get me wrong, it's, it's really cool having to change between like air attacks and ground attacks. It's really good, okay? It deserves this spot. But I think it gets extra points for the way you kill him. Uh, you don't really kill him in a quick time event as you usually do in God of War fights. 
It's really interesting. You have to hit his tentacles until he gets lower and lower until his mouth aligns with the bridge. And then you pull him down the lever and then he just dies. It's just all their God of War games just have a little bit more style than new ones. But you know what? This next fight does have a little bit of style or at least a little bit of surprise, which is what makes it special. Of course, I'm talking about Vanadis, aka Freya in disguise. And again, I think what makes this fight somewhat special is because it comes out of nowhere. Atreus just returned from Ironwood. Kratos is pissed at him they fought the hell walkers and you think you are freed you're going home now and suddenly freya just shows out of nowhere and starts stomping your face with a valhalla move and suddenly you start to get flashbacks of you know the previous valkyries from 2018 this fight is nowhere near as difficult as those valkyries but it still has that same essence where freya or Venatus is just relentless she's got sword attacks she's got bow attacks that you have to constantly be aware of also acid pools that you also have to constantly be aware of i know i've said the word intensity a lot but uh you know this this fight just coming out of nowhere just adds a lot to the intensity you're like oh my god Odin is starting thing. He's sending Valkyries to attack Kratos now. Ultimately, story-wise, it was a little bit disappointing because this is supposed to be, you know, the fulfillment of Freya's speech in 2018 where she says she's gonna drag Kratos through all the realms, like his dead body. You don't really get to see that, but it's okay because the fight just, it's, it comes with that shock element and it's also very demanding. Like, you really have to be good at the game. You have to know your parries. You have to know how to dodge properly. It's a, it's a solid fight and you know what? Good job, Santa Monica. Another fight that Santa Monica nailed was the second fight with Baldur. And this one is almost like the opposite to the fight with Vanadis, because while the fight with Vanadis is really good in its gameplay mechanics and not so much in the story, the fight with Baldur is really good in its story component, but not so much in its mechanics. It's not necessarily bad. Baldur in this fight is a lot faster than the first time you fought him, and he now has both ice and fire powers that require you to change your weapons constantly. I originally liked this concept, but the more I played it, I begin to get that Simon Says feeling. I believe Sesti has a video discussing this issue. If I find it, I'll link it in the description below. But despite these issues, I can overlook them because this whole part in the story is just so exciting that it makes the fight itself feel more exciting than what it actually is. It's the moment where all the story threats begin to intercept and you feel like you're at the movies watching a really immersive story. You just recently learned that Freya is Baldur's mother, meaning that Freya is conflicted between saving his son, who's clearly in the wrong, or protecting Kratos and Atreus, who she has gotten a lot closer to. She also reanimates the corpse of Thamur, a character whose story also has parenthood themes. From time to time, Baldur forgets about Kratos and Atreus and goes after his mother. Again, this is one of those fights that just glues you to your seat as you excitingly wait to see how everything will unfold. In all honesty, if Baldur was a better enemy, meaning mechanics-wise, I might have placed this fight in the top 10. I'm not even lying right now. Okay, so next we have the fight with Thor. Look, th this fight gets a lot of hate in the community for one reason. The fight does not feel very important, especially when you know it takes place in the Ragnarok battle. And I agree with this criticism 100%. I feel like there should have been a moment where you have to fight Thor on top of Jormungandr or something exciting like that. Give it some scale, some pizzazz to make the final fight with Thor feel more memorable. But despite this issue, I still love this fight. For one thing in this fight, we got the Thor that many God of War fans wanted to see. A bloodthirsty thunder god. Also, compared to the first fight with him, the amount of attack patterns you have to memorize in this fight is a lot more. And at least for me, that's always a win. When I first fought him, I died a couple of times, because this fight will truly test your knowledge of the series' new formula. It's no surprise that this is one of the fights that I still have a save file dedicated to it, in case I ever feel like going back to it and playing it again. Because it truly is that fun. If this fight only had a little more scale, it would have probably been in the top 5. Next is the fight with Odin, which also has a very similar problem, but overall handles the fight a little bit better. But the fight itself is pretty good. Odin has to have one of the most extensive attack moves in the entire Norse saga. I don't remember if I died with him a couple of times, but I do remember being completely engaged with this fight. The fight felt more like an approachable Valkyrie, and much like Thor, I also have a save file dedicated to this fight because sometimes I'd like to go back and play it again. The reason this fight is slightly better than Thor's is because it leans more into the exciting part of the Ragnarok battle. You know, you're fighting with Freya and, and almost a Demos, I mean Atreus, next to your side. And it's just, it's really exciting seeing all of these gods locked in battle in a fight that will determine the fate of the Norse pantheon. It's, it's really exciting. But again, much like Thor, I feel like this boss needed some more pizzazz. 
ass, given that I was the final one. For example, I don't think I was the only one who wanted to fight him while he rode Slipnir, but instead the game left us asking, Where is it? Hmm? I know I should judge a fight for what it was instead of for what it could have been. And don't get me wrong, I'm not doing that. Both the fights of Thor with Odin are really good. They were one of the most engaging ones in the Norse saga. They just needed a little bit more bells and whistles, but you know what? That's just me, I guess. Next we have you, Riley. And I know it feels weird to play such a minor character above Thor and Odin, but sometimes boss fights don't give a crap about the character's ranks. And I think this is exactly the case with you, Riley. First of all, the build up to this fight is just great. You're just walking through her abandoned temple while coming across many of her petrified victims. Then you enter her chambers and you think you're just gonna read a book and suddenly and she just pops out of nowhere. Fighting her is also a unique experience because she's not like the humanoid bosses you fight. And she's also not like the giant bosses the series is known for. Instead, she's its own weird monster thing. And this isn't a good thing just because it looks cool. Because she has the body of a snake, her attacks are very unique. She can sweep you with her big ass tail. Do snakes have a tail? <laughs> it's just their own body? Do snakes have a tail? I forget that one. She can also rise up and go for a couple of unpredictable ground pounds, and of course she can freeze you in place using her powers. This mechanic alone can make for some really intense moments. Again, this is not a really big and important fight, but lately, I don't know, I just find myself really liking it, and I don't have a safe file for it, but every time I get there, oof, it gets real fun. Next is Nidhogg. Now, you guys know that I've given God of War Ragnarok a lot of crap for that fulfilling a lot of the story setups of God of War 2018, but one thing Santa Monica absolutely nailed in that regard was Freya's curse. I think it's really cool that the reason Freya can't leave Medgar is because all of the realm's roots are tangled, and trying to untangle them results in summoning the protector of the world tree. That concept alone is great storytelling in a mythological setting. But this fight finds itself this high on the list because it's also really freaking good. Unlike the dragon from God of War 2018, this encounter feels more like an actual fight. The amount of attack this creature has is insane. And even though I've done this fight a couple of times now, not a couple, quite a lot, like, I, I still die. Like, it's, it's that demanding of a fight and I think that's what makes it so memorable. Not to mention that this fight also makes you play around with the sigil mechanics in some interesting ways. So that itself just makes it more unique. And on an emotional level, it's very similar to the fight with Thanatos in, in Ghost of Sparta, where you're fighting with Themos. And this one instead you're fighting next to Freya, who this whole time has been pissed at you. And now like you're just playing as a team and it just it just feels really good playing side by side with such an awesome character. And you know that ending, you know, Norse games don't have quick time events to end their fights, but I just, I love how this fight ends. Your last soul refire! Like, you can tell that Freya doesn't want to do it, and Nidhogg herself is not really a bad character. She's just protecting the world tree. But, I don't know, this is one of those fights that nails both aspects of its gameplay and story. Just, just a beautiful fight. I love it. But, when talking about big and awesome boss fights, we have to talk about the one that started it all. Of course, I'm referring to the Hydra from God of War 1. I know I've said this many times before, but I'm pretty sure this is the fight that just made me a God of War fan. I was already kind of on board when the game started off really dark with them, like, you know, uh, doing a self-murder. But man, when this snake just popped his head through the, the ship's hull, things just changed. Like, it was just epic on a whole nother scale. There's another fight with him like in the ship that's a little more a traditional boss fight and then you fight uh, the two smaller heads and the big one. I like this part of the fight because it goes more into that puzzle element that got older God of War fights were known for where you have to weaken their her smaller heads and then I don't know like harpoon them with the anchor. I don't even know what, what he stabs them with but it's just really cool that it has a more platforming aspect to it. And then just fighting the big head is epic on a whole nother scale where you have to slowly break the ship's mast and stab him, stab the Hydra with it. I don't know, it's what I always wanted in a mythological game and just th th this fight just completely delivered. But of course, moving up to an even bigger boss fight is Kronos. Oh my god. The Kronos boss fight was, for the longest time, my favorite thing in anything gaming related. Not just my favorite boss fight, but just my favorite thing in all of gaming. I believe this whole section took Santa Monica months to make, and it truly shows. 
Now, the reason this fight is no longer number one is it suffers from that issue that some God of War fights suffer from, that it, it's not really a boss fight, it's more of a level, but sometimes it is a boss fight. But who cares? This is just epic. This fight would make it this high up in the list just with that move where, you know, you have to get in between uh, Kronos' finger by looking at this shadow where the hand's gonna fall. That part is just cool alone. That, that alone, that, this is cool. I'm stuttering, that's how cool that part is, man. Look, Kronos, it's just an epic encounter, okay? If you haven't, if you haven't encountered him yet, you need to buy God of War 3 and play it. It's that freaking good. Now, I always thought that these big boss battles were only possible in the older God of War games due to the camera and all that. But um, that has changed with uh, a boss fight in God of War Ragnarok. Of course, I'm talking about Garm. Oh my god, I love this boss fight so freaking much. Unlike Kronos, this boss fight feels more like an actual boss fight, like there's more room to make mistakes. And I think that's what makes it so exciting, like just... Garm is just so huge, but you have to fight him so up close and personal, like, I don't know, the Thor fight, like, it's just great. The amount of moves that this guy has is insane. This fight also requires you to use the spear, so it's sort of like the Scorpius fight where it requires you to use another weapon, but it just feels more organic here. The boss also nails that feeling of constantly being followed by an unstoppable force of nature. This boss fight is just great. There's only one thing that would have made it perfect. As it stands right now, this boss fight is 10 out of 10. But if they would have done this, it would have been 11 out of 10. I'm talking about that move where uh, he throws a chain at you and then you have to freeze it. That whole section is it's pretty scripted. Like, once like the chain just gets stuck and then you freeze it. If I were to freely be able to throw my axe whenever I wanted and freeze him in place and then go up to him and throw him around, that would have made this boss fight absolutely perfect number one okay number one no question about it but you know what it's all good the boss fight it's still great and i just i can't wait to see what santa monica does next with this you know style of boss fight this and i just can't wait to see how they expand this idea even further now even though garm is an amazing boss it just can't compete with the original unstoppable force of nature that is the colossus of Rhodes. it just can't now, I know some of you might think the Colossus made it this high in the list just because I have a thing for statues, especially moving statues, mmm. But all joking aside, I think the Colossus of Rhodes is simply the best of the giant boss fights in the series. The Colossus had the job of teaching players the basics of the game and it does a wonderful job at doing so, no question about that. But I think the reason this boss battle stands out more than the other giant bosses is due to how relentless the Colossus is in tracking Kratos. Sometimes you'll be minding your own business and suddenly you have to attack his eye or avoid his giant arm as he breaks through a building, or survive a collapsing bridge, or a collapsing roof. Like, this guy is everywhere and just keeps the intro feeling really fresh and exciting. It's like Santa Monica watched that Jason and the Argonauts scene with the Talus statue and said like, how can we make this better? And they did, like they just made it 20 times more action-y, like it just, of course it's a video game, but it's just, it felt engaging the whole time. Just, just an amazing boss fight. The Colossus also brings back that puzzle element that I like so much of the series, when you go inside of him and you have to hit his little dangly mouth thing that's a metal, I don't really know why that's in there, but it's just a fun little puzzle and then you get to like, go out of him and as he explodes and then his arm falls on you, it's just a, it's just a really good boss battle, like as, a, as intros goes, it just, it, it doesn't get any better than this and yeah, Garm is great but Come on, it's a moving statue. Mm -hmm. Next we have Hercules. This one isn't epic for its size, but instead is epic for the importance of this confrontation. After many years of getting God of War games, we finally got to fight mythology's strongest mortal in God of War 3. And it did not disappoint. Okay, the first part is okay as you're just fighting his minions. But when he puts on the Nemean Cestus, what you get is the battle of the century between two powerful warriors. Hercules is different from the other bosses in the sense that he's a tank. It's going to be really hard to get close to him, which means making attack windows becomes the main fun factor of the fight. If you think you can just attack him from far away with your blades, think again because Hercules loves to parry your attacks. This is where you'll have to thank outside Pandora's box and use his minions against him by throwing them at him or flat out ramming them into him. I also love the concept and execution of weakening him by slowly taking away his armor. I don't know, the ram mechanic is just one of my favorite things in the series, and I'm just glad it was implemented in this boss fight somehow. It just, it works perfectly. The third stage is where things get heated as Hercules becomes the world champion in wrestling. This fight simply moves at a beautiful pace that culminates in one of the most iconic quick time events of all time. I'm not gonna show you because I don't want to get demonetized, but, you know, you, you know what his face ends up looking by, by the end of it. <laughs> 
Next we have Ares, the OG God of War. The Ares fight, if I'm being completely honest with you guys, hasn't aged very well, at least when it comes to the camera. And Ares as an enemy has some pretty interesting attack patterns that you have to memorize, but they can't really compete with other ones in the series. So I'm sure you're now asking yourself, why did I place it so high up in the list then? Well, the second stage in my opinion is just amazing. I know this is where some of you quit due to how crazy the difficulty spike is, but I don't know, I just love the concept of this section so much. You have to fight clones of Kratos himself, who by the way are completely new enemies and they are relentless as you would expect. You have to do this while also sacrificing your health to save Calliope and Lysandra. This might not seem like much, but when you play on harder difficulties, having to juggle fighting Kratos and saving your family can make for a very rewarding boss fight. But by far, my favorite part of the fight has to be the last stage. Simply because it's one of the most unique design ideas that I wonder why it hasn't been implemented in other boss fights before. If you don't know what I'm talking about, which I'm sure you do, in this part of the fight, both Kratos and Ares share a health bar. And this makes for a really interesting tug of war feeling in a boss fight. At times, you might think you're close to beating Ares. This is where you're most vulnerable because if you slip up just one time, just one time, Ares will gain the upper hand in seconds, undoing all of your hard work. And then you have to start again, and again, and again. Maybe this is why some fans don't like this fight as much, but for me, this intensity is where it's at when it comes to final boss fights. It just, it was the perfect design idea for the final confrontation with the original God of War, and I just love it so much. Next we have... the God of War again! <laughs> Or how I like to call him, the Redeemer. Not because Tyr looks a little bit like Jesus, but because this fight redeemed the disappointing appearance of Tyr in God of War Ragnarok. In Valhalla, Tyr is depicted as a grade A badass therapist. <laughs> the fight itself has to be one of the most unique ones in the series. I, I know I've said this many times, but in the case of Tyr, that really is the case, because Valhalla is a roguelike, and Tyr was created specifically to fit this genre of game. The first time you fight him, he will come at you with a spear and shield. The second time he will pull out a stanastic maquitol. The third time he brings out two Egyptian swords. And lastly, he brings out a katana. You see what I meant when I said this was a unique fight? The change of weapons not only shows you how culturally refined Tyr is, but it also keeps the fight feeling fresh every time you meet him. This fight is just a great clash between two formidable god of wars, and I hope we see something like this in the future again. That is if they do another roguelike, but you know, I don't know. If we don't, it's fine. This fight is awesome. Next on the list is Hurston Mist, the best of the dual fights in my opinion. The reason I say this fight is better than Magni and Modi's is because it has everything that made that fight so great, plus some new environmental attacks and minus the whole all their froclip blinder stuff. Something else that helps this fight a lot is the location it takes place in. The Spark of the World is just an absolutely beautiful location. Overall, this fight just has a lot of style. From the beginning when they show up like TIE Fighters, to every time they regain their health by praying to Odin by saying, Oh Father, grant us the strength we seek! Give me your name! Come on, it just, it, it, this fight gets so pumped, man! But again, it's not just style, the fight itself is very demanding. After all, you are fighting two Valkyries and they do not hold back. This fight is also great because it feels like the culmination of Atreus' training as a young warrior. And this is shown best in the final cutscene of the fight, when you see that Atreus can stand side by side with his father as long as he's in bear form. It, the, the fight itself is just, it's really cool, it came at an unexpected time, and uh, yeah, I just, I love it. Next on the list is Sigrum. Remember when I said I didn't want to get too much into detail with Kana and King Rolf? Well, Sigrum is the reason. Because while Kana and King Rolf are great bosses, the tradition of super difficult bosses started with Sigrum. I still remember working my way through all the Valkyries and getting stronger in the process, only for Sigrum to show up and absolutely wreck me in two seconds. The scythe just comes out of nowhere! It's not your fault. Oh! It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Oh! I knew this fight was going to be hard, but I didn't expect it to be this hard because Sigrum's moveset consists of a lot of moves from other Valkyries that I fought before. So I went into the fight saying, I'm so ready for this, I'm gonna go and kick her ass. Next thing you know, I'm still fighting her until it's 3am. I understand that difficulty is a big hurdle for some gamers, but at least for me there's nothing more satisfying than staying up late learning all of her attack patterns. You could look up a tutorial on how to beat her easily, but why? Why would you do that? 
Part of the fun of this fight is just how many times you'll die. Because deep down you know that it's not the game's fault, it's yours for sucking. And I know that self-hate is not a good thing to do, I know, I know. But whenever Sigrun stomped on my head as she yelled Valhalla, it just fueled me to get better at the fight and eventually I did. It took me a long time, but I did it. And I would not take any of it back. It was absolutely amazing just getting to experience this fight. Again, all of these emotions are present when fighting these guys, but Sigrun will always hold a special place in my heart just by being the first. Next we have the Thor boss fight, that is, the first one. Arguably one of the most anticipated boss fights in all of gaming. No, I am not exaggerating. Seeing the Ghost of Sparta clash with the Norse God of Thunder was something every God of War fan of the series has always wanted. Hell, even people who weren't into God of War always imagined Kratos fighting Thor. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. And luckily for us, Santa Monica did not disappoint with this boss fight. As is always the case with the Norse games, the story is what grounds everything, even the boss fight itself. And right off the bat, Santa Monica threw us for a loop, because when we first meet Thor, he doesn't seem that threatening. The story lowers your guard by making you think that for a second Thor is not going to do anything. And then suddenly he pulls the hammer and he sends Kratos flying all across Medgard. Come on, even the people who didn't like this game have to admit that this is one of the coolest way to start any fight. The fight from there is just what you would expect, a lot of destruction, a lot of blood, and a lot of trash talking on Thor's side. But one thing I wasn't expecting was a death fake out that just serves to show you just how powerful this version of Thor is. Oh no, I say when we're done. <laughs> Unlike other intro fights in the series, this one is slightly different due to how charged with emotion it is. On one side, there's Kratos who's still trying to be a better person by not going back into his god-killing mode. And on the other side, there's Thor, who's trying to specifically bring out that part of Kratos just so he can justify not changing as a person. It's a level of emotion that a fight with any big monsters just doesn't have because it's just big monster, you know. Now on the side of gameplay, I know that Thor's moveset is nowhere near as complex as the last fight, but he still puts up a good fight. I died a couple of times, I believe, the first time I fought him, but even if I didn't, uh, who cares? Overall, this fight is just epic. If you want a harder challenge, just turn up the difficulty, that way you get the best of both worlds, but you don't have to. We all knew this fight was going to be all about scale, and it didn't disappoint. Now for this next entry, I was really debating whether to put it below or above Thor's fight. Because in essence, they are very similar fights. Of course, I'm talking about The Stranger. My turn. An argument can be made that Thor's fight is better. So if you think that's the case, more power to you. For me, however, the Baldur fight has an edge over Thor's due to its surprise factor. With Thor, we all knew that the fight would consist of a lot of destruction. But with this skinny dude, we weren't too sure how the fight would unravel. That is until he shows you just how deceptively strong he is. The clash between Kratos and Baldur is just epic in the amount of destruction inflicted on the environment. But it was also the fight that showed up how a camera that never cuts can add a layer of immersion that other fights just don't have. In other words, the fight does not give you a break. You're going to be glued to your seat seeing Kratos fight Baldur in his backyard, on his roof, in his garden, ramming him with a tree, splitting the ground beneath him. The fact is, giving a description of this fight just doesn't do it justice. You have to go and experience it for yourself. You will have to walk a lot around, but you know, it will eventually get to the good part. Now, I'm sure you've noticed throughout this video that I've been judging bosses on gameplay, scale, and story. And so far, most of these fights have only had one of these things that they absolutely nail. But with the Hades boss fight, I feel like this boss fight nails all of them exceptionally well. On the side of story, Hades is one of those few bosses that Kratos has some history with. In Chains of Olympus, you killed his wife, and in God of War 1, you escaped his domain. Meaning that before this encounter, Kratos has made a joke out of Hades. Which is, I guess, why he starts to fight by trying to steal his soul. On the side of scale, Hades isn't as big as Kronos, but he's still much bigger than your regular humanoid bosses. And I think this size was important to at least make you feel like you were really fighting a god, one of the top of the Greek gods, like, it, it's important. But of course the most important thing in a boss fight is the gameplay, or how much the boss tests your knowledge of the game. And Hades is probably the best at it. Remember when I complained how the fight with Kryla only consisted of you shooting arrows at her magic cauldron? Well, with Hades, you have to rip part of his body and stop his arms from getting a hold of it. You have to run away from his teleporting claws. You have to avoid the souls he sends your way. You still have to worry about him stealing your soul. You'll have to be quick and running towards the safe area. 
There's a small mini game halfway through where he tries to dump you in the river sticks. You have to fight him in an even bigger form while you use his own weapons against him. I could go on, the truth is, the fight is very demanding of you as a gamer. It's one of those fights that becomes more and more fun the harder the difficulty of the game. And it does all of this while also feeling epic in scale and in story relevance. Hades is just an absolutely great, he's the GOAT. Okay, maybe not, we still have two more, but Hades is amazing. On the prestigious number two spot, I have decided to go with... Zeus from God of War 3. I don't think I have ever experienced the hype I felt while anticipating the death of Zeus. You have to understand that for gamers, waiting three years to kill the main villain of the series is a very long time. Time spent thinking about how good that boss fight will be. Luckily for us, Santa Monica knew this and gave us one epic boss fight. Not necessarily epic in scale, but epic in intensity. Unlike the Odin fight, the Zeus fight felt a lot longer. This is because the fight consists of three stages. Well, the second stage is pretty short, but you do get that epic camera zoom out to appreciate the plot twist that Gaia is still alive. But on the first stage, Santa Monica tried something new, something completely new. The perspective of the fight became 2D, and I think they did this to further increase that intensity I was talking about. Because in a 3D environment, there's a lot more room for you to run around. In a 2D environment, your focus is completely diverted to the boss in front of you. It gives you that feeling of being stuck in a cage arena with a worthy opponent. And it does all of this without feeling funky like an old 2D action game. This was still a God of War game full of delicious combos for you to do on Zeus. And while the third stage you don't get that extreme focus, the fight still maintains that intensity with Zeus's many clones. Throw in a mechanic where both Kratos and Zeus can heal with Gaia's heart, and you have one of the most epic and dynamic fights in the series. And oh my god, that quick time event, no, you know what, before that, oh my god, have you listened to the music in this fight? As you wish. Relax guys, it's, it's just moisturizer. Sponsored by... Getting back to that epic quick time event, there's actually two. It's really cool that Santa Monica lets us choose how much hatred Kratos had for Zeus by letting us punch him for as long as we want. But I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about the other previous one where both of them are using their godly strength to gain the advantage over the other one. And when you finally get those button prompts right and you activate the Blade of Olympus and stab Zeus and Gaia simultaneously, come on, come on. Santa Monica cooked for three years with this fight, and it shows. But of course, the ultimate, the greatest boss fight in the God of War series goes to the Sisters of Fate. While Zeus is a good boss fight, an argument can be made that the hype was a big factor in making it as memorable as it was. But with the Sisters, that hype wasn't there. The Sisters fight, in my opinion, is the best in the series because it's the most layered of them all. It's the fight where I truly felt like I needed to use every skill I learned up to that point. It's the only fight in the game that implements the grapple mechanic in a truly meaningful way. This fight is nothing but risk and reward. You know, the stuff good gaming is built on. The fight also implements a level of scale that's just not present in other fights of the series. Of course, I'm talking about when Atropos takes Kratos back in time with a mission to erase him from the timeline. This is arguably the weakest stage in the fight, as you're just fighting off regular enemies while also trying to stop Atropos from destroying the bridge. So, let's say that you get bored in this fight and just lower your guard. Well, the game rewards you with a pretty cool cutscene still. This cutscene gives you a sense of immersion into the story that's just not a lot of boss battles do. It's not about demolishing the boss's health bar, it's about Kratos fighting fate itself. Maybe I'm being a little bit too dramatic, but the, the scenario, like the, the fight where it takes place, it just feels really cool. But even if you ignore all of that, this section also introduces you to Atropos' powers, which will be greatly enhanced in the third stage when she teams up with Lachesis. And this stage is where the fight shines the most, as it combined good boss battle mechanics with that scale of fighting fate itself I was talking about. Because now you're not just dealing with grapple points and Lachesis, you now have to deal with Atropos as well. And it's not as simple as just hitting her until she dies. This boss fight also has that puzzle element that I like so much in the series, as it makes you trap Atropos back in time 
time using their very own powers. You don't see them get trapped in a cutscene or even a quick time event. No, you have to do it yourself by smashing the mirrors to smithereens. And this is what I meant when I said the fight was layered. Every single time you're doing something new, but it never gets so overwhelming that you get frustrated. It's a demanding fight, but a fair one. Santa Monica must have known the mirrors would be a fun mechanic in this fight, because the fight doesn't end in a flashy quick time event like it always does. Well, it does have one, but the fight instead lets you enjoy the fear in the fate's eyes as you pull out the barbarian hammer that you will use to smash to pieces their only way back. This boss fight is simply video game art, and I will fight anyone who says otherwise. I hope one day Santa Monica dethrones it, but until then, the Sisters of Fate boss fight will remain the best in the series. Well there you have it guys, my official ranking of all of the bosses in the God of War series. You have no idea how long this video has taken me to finally finish it. Part of the reason why it has taken me so long to finish this video is because after I finished recording my script, I started editing and then I said, hey, I don't think this one should go above this one. So I've been making changes as I was editing. It has been crazy, but uh, I, I'm pretty happy with the end result. Of course, let me know what you think of my ranking. I'm sure you're going to disagree, but that's what's fun about these videos. We all have our own different, you know, favorite bosses. But of course, I will ask you one thing. If you enjoyed the video, please like and share it. Again, it has taken me so long. I could have made so many other videos in the time it has taken me to make this one. But I decided to put it all into this one. So please, let this, let this be worth it, please. Please! But if not, it's okay, because I got my awesome members to thank for supporting the channel monthly. You guys are simply awesome, and I cannot say thank you enough, so I'm gonna do it again. From the bottom of my heart, thank you guys. I would also like to thank everyone who likes and shares my videos. I know it doesn't seem like much, but trust me, it really does help. And with that said, thanks for watching, and remember, go forth in the name of Valhalla.